to today's event, Life After Slavery, Unleashing Workers from the Labor Market in Brazil, which features Victor Figuera, uh, Figueras, who is of the Federal University of Bahia. I might warn you, if you have funny little things that make noises like cell phones in the middle of the event, you might want to ask them not to. Um, so I'm Charles Briggs. I teach in the Department of Anthropology here at Berkeley, and I'm a proud affiliate of the Center for Latin American Studies, which is the, uh, which sponsored, kindly sponsored the event today. And I would like to thank uh, Janet Wegeman for definitely organizing the event, and Jonathan Flores, who's going to keep the technological infrastructure moving during the, this today. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the unceded territory of the Huichen, the ancestral and, uh, lands of the Cochenio Olone. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Olone people. We recognize that all of us in Berkeley have benefited from and continue to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with the university's values of community and diversity, which are not necessarily represented in terms of the continued occupation, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible um, the university's um, trouble, I should say, relationship often to indigenous peoples by offering this land acknowledgement admittedly uh, insufficient. We affirm indigenous sovereignty and our commitment to hold the universe, university more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. So the format of today's event is that I have an extremely brief role, which is I get to introduce uh, Professor Vina Dubal, who will then introduce the speaker and we'll be in dialogue with him. And then I think, well, somebody, I can moderate the QA or you can, it doesn't matter. So Professor Dubal is the professor of law at the University of California, Irvine. But she's no stranger to Berkeley, having received both a PhD um, and a JD um, here from UC Berkeley. Her doctoral work grew out of her um, um, work as a public interest attorney who supported precarious workers. In addition to receiving prestigious fellowships and publishing in leading law journals, she's a public intellectual who appears in many prominent media outlets. And it's wonderful to welcome, back, welcome you back to Berkeley. Thank you, Charles. Just very briefly. So, um, we have to do this because it's being recorded and people will want to watch it later also. Um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Professor Pugueras, who is with us from, as um, Charles indicated, from UFBA in Brazil. Um, I also am very grateful to, to Janet um, and to Jonathan for facilitating this event. Thank you. Um, and to the center for, for making sure that it happens. Um, very briefly, briefly, I just want to give you some back, background on Vitor. Uh, in addition to being an economist, he was a labor investigator for 10 years for the labor ministry. Um, in that context, he led over 1,000 operations, or many operations that rescued um, uh, up to 1,000 workers who were um, uh, held in modern slave-like conditions. Um, and <clears throat> in his capacity as an economist, I think has thought really uh, creatively about how to use the academy, how to use public policy to solve many of the, or maybe not to solve, but to, um, to address many of the issues that he saw as a labor investigator for over 10 years. And so currently, he has been appointed to Brazil's Funda Centro, which is the Occupational Health and Safety Foundation. And at Funda Centro, he has many interesting projects, um, including one that he's going to talk about today, and um, for which I really wanted to welcome him um, to the US. I brought him specifically to talk about these, this particular project because um, it is a unusual way, uh, something that we have not seen in the US, a proactive state attempt to, to solve um, the problem of you know, extraordinarily poor working conditions, not through the application of labor laws, but actually taking workers out of the labor market um, to create sort of more fair, um, cooperative conditions, which is, again, like something that, you know, we haven't seen in, um, in the US context. So I'll hand it over to him. And um, after he gives his talk, I will spend some time um, asking him questions, but we can make it a very informal sort of conversation as well. Um, so without further ado. Yay. 
that it? Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> it's nice being here. Thank you so much, Professor Briggs, for having me. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Jonathan, for organizing this talk. Thank you, of course, Professor Vina for the invitation to come to the US and had some opportunities to extend some ideas. Uh, first of all, I would really like you to like feel free and honest. If it's not clear, if my English is kind of confusing, just ask me, okay? And I can make things clear or try to make things clear. Uh, I try to be as direct and forward as I can, but as a professor, we are used to talk, so sometimes we can get a little bit uh, engaged in the subject and talk a little bit, a lot. But I'm gonna try to to be as, as straight as I can. If Professor Dubao wants to control my time at some point, say, okay, Vitor, that's enough. Feel free. <coughs> the good news is that I have a voice today. I'm feeling good because when I got here, I had a very bad jet lag. I was feeling terrible. Uh, but now I think I'm fine. We can do it proper, properly today. I hate to do slides, but I made one so that some things that I will talk about can be, <coughs> let's say, not only uh, absurd by you, using our imagination, but also seeing like what real stuff I'm talking about. Uh, I have two main goals here talking to you today. The first one is to make it clear what slave-like conditions are, what's, or labor analogous to slavery, or modern slavery. Modern slavery. I'm using these concepts uh, as the same thing, I'm considering that all of them can be uh, understood as the same thing. Uh, but normally, people, even academics, do not have the approach that I think that's more consistent, consistent regarding the way our societies work. That's my main point here to begin with. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how the regulation, or actually the attempts to fight or to tackle slave-like conditions uh, have been going in Brazil since the last 20 years. And then, like the main talk, I hope I can be briefly in this first part to address specifically uh, this project that's an attempt to be a public policy. Uh, it's not like a, a the aim is not to be something peripheral regarding labor issues in Brazil. It's starting as something small, but the idea is to cover all situations in which slave life conditions are caused by the state. So it's a state-based <coughs> public policy that's been going on. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. Especially the concepts, like Professor Dubal has said, that's underneath, not only underneath, that builds the public policy, policy itself, but also the features, how it's been designed and how it's been carried out so far. Uh, and I think this title, I don't know if it was Professor Dubal that had the idea, summarized perfectly both the main issue that we're dealing with, with like conditions and its relation to the labor market itself, and the aim of the project that's uh, literal translation in English, it's life after rescue. In Portuguese, it's vida pois resgate. What happens to people that are caught in slave like conditions in Brazil? And the aim of the project, literally, is to take people out of the labor markets. And <clears throat> that's where we're gonna get by the end of my talk here. Like I said, please feel free to interrupt me if it's necessary and say, look, it's confusing. You said something that doesn't make sense in English. Sometimes that can happen. <clears throat> so as Professor Dubal said, I'm currently ser serving 
uh, appointed to a position at Fundacentro is a public foundation at the Ministry of Labor. I used to be a labor inspector myself in the Ministry of Labor. I was there for 10 years. I was kind of, uh, I had police powers, you know, to enforce labor law on a federal level. Then I went out and became a professor at the University of Bahia, literally to try to develop some projects like this one. And I was lucky to get this position now and trying to carry out what I had planned before. So it's kind of a nice coincidence that I'm dealing in my life right now. This picture here is not random. By the opposite, these guys are some of the fellows that are part of one of the associations that are supported by the project I'm going to talk about. So the first main thing, and as promised, try to be as fast as I can regarding this like putting things in their positions to make things clear. When you talk about slave life conditions, you're not talking about necessarily individual coercion, you know, people being chained, forced, literally forced labor, people being beaten up, and something like that. These kind of situations happen in Brazil and happen all over the world, even here, as you know. But the main thing that we're talking about goes beyond it. We're talking about the coercion, the collective coercion that it's uh, created by labor market itself. The fact that most people do not have the means of production, so they have to sell their workforce. It creates the coercion, the so-called economic coercion that makes people vulnerable, vulnerable enough that can be, they can be submitted to any kind of very bad working conditions. I'm not talking about McDonald's conditions that are bad. I'm talking about slave-like conditions. So when you talk about slave-like conditions, when you talk about <coughs> labor analogs to slavery, when you talk about modern slavery, we cannot just think about individual coercion. And why is that? Why, why structurally we, we can't think this way? Because that's not how our society is built. As I said, of course, we are gonna see, and we see in many instances, people being individually coerced, you know? Being beaten up, employers uh, uh, retaining documents, you know, to coerce people to work. But it's not, law, not like how the labor markets, how our society, by definition, coerce workers to work. The coercion, the push that make, makes people work normally in a capitalist society, is labor market itself. When people are normally submitted to very bad conditions, it's not because they are being beaten up. It can happen, but it's not the norm. It's not the structural way of, co of co coercion that builds our society. Of course, this powerness, the strength of coercion that labor markets can put in someone will depend on many factors, especially the limits of exploitation that are built in each country. In a country with hard labor law, good labor law, the coercion may be uh, not so hard. If you have social rights, for example, if you have some kind of, uh, uh, how to say, universal income, workers have some degree of autonomy to negotiate conditions because they are not starving to death. But, as Polony would tell us, by definition, the labor market creates or actually destroys the right to live. So normally, people don't have other option other than sell the workforce. So if there isn't any kind of limits put by society, whether from the demand perspective, labor law, unions are organizing, to make the employer respect some kind of limits, or if there aren't social rights that can reduce a little bit the vulnerability of workers, Anything can happen in this relation regards extreme forms of exploitation. 
So I'm trying to stress here, as trying to be very short, is we're not talking about something old. We're not talking about some reminiscence, you know, something that's not part of our society and we're going to get rid of. No. Extreme forms of, of exploitation, slave-like conditions, are a potential and something that's likely to happen in any capital society. That's the point that uh, we have to stress. And we're not talking about something peripheric in our society. We're talking something about that's on the frame, on the core, is a potential thing that can happen because of the way our society is built and the way people are coerced to work. So, just to give you some very, very basic instance, when I went to England, I did a postdoc there, and uh, there is a, a, an agency there, a public agency, that circles uh, slave like conditions. It's called the Gang Master's License, uh, License Authority. Uh, it it's, it's enforces the modern slavery. Modern Slavery Act from 2015 there, among other uh, acts. And I'm just comparing here, I'm not comparing, it's a description, then we're going to see some pictures of chick pick, chicken picking, you know, in farms in the UK, an inspection made by the Gang Master License Authority, and an inspection made by myself in Brazil. Uh, and it's very, very, very similar. We're talking about people that were, were sleeping, sleeping, resting, making their foods, having their meals above the feces, the excrements of the chickens. Why was that? Because uh, the excrements of the uh, chickens are very good fertilizers. So it's a commodity as well. In England, they would have to work in 12 hours shifts, being uh, transported from one farm to the other farm by a middle guy, the so-called gang masters. They would have to make their necessities, this, their physical necessities, within inside the trucks during the transportation between one farm to the other farm. In Brazil, I caught, I caught the workers sleeping literally above the feces. So when we are talking about slave-like conditions, we are talking about conditions that are similar to slavery, literally similar. Doesn't mean that the person, as I said, just to stress, was being chained or was being beaten up, it can happen and sometimes it happens. But the main thing that explains this kind of situation is the vulnerability of the person. The person needs to survive. That's the point. That's the what, what we have to keep in mind. So just to, to give you a, a clue, it's for me, isn't it? It's one of, one of the farms that I went. All you can see there, brown stuff, that's it. What you are imagining? So that's from the chickens. So, uh, as you can imagine, as a labor inspector, I could like give a trillion pictures, very, very bad situation, and so on. But I think that this one kind of summarizes, you know, this is like this like by conditions. It's not hard to, to describe. You know, someone is making money of someone else that's working. You understand what, what is it? That's his, his credit. He's working all day long there, sleeping there, having his meals there. What's I'm talking about it. What's something important here to the next step, and then I can get to the project? It may happen in any place. You can see situations like that, as I have just shown, showed you in 
the US, in the UK. You have situations like that in the, the, here in the US. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it however you like. Literally, they are slave like conditions, similar to what former slaves would face 200 years ago. What's my point here? My point here is that in Brazil, specifically, there is a law that defines it. There is an article on the penal code that says what labor analog slavery is. And it's brilliant because it states that it's not just, it states, of course, that it's a crime to force someone to work, you know, like literally individual coercion, but it always states that it's also a crime if you submit someone to degrading conditions of labor or to exhausting journeys, exhausting working time. As to say, even if the person is not being individually coerced, the crime remains. So when you see something like that, it doesn't matter if the person was kidnapped to go there. It's a crime. You cannot submit someone to this situation. So in Brazil, there is a task force to tackle this situation. A task force uh, composed, made by different institutions. It's a <coughs> public policy, indeed, made by labor inspection, public minister of labor, the federal police. And they investigate and go after uh, the employers to catch people in slave-like conditions. And when they do, we call it technically a rescue. For example, if, when I was a labor inspector, I'd go there. And if I, not if I, when I saw something like that, I'd say, look, that's a crime. That's slave-like condition. These people are going to be rescued. The employer will have to pay all their rights. Wages, uh, lawsuits also is going to be uh, taken to the court against the employer. The employer might even face jail. And this public policy has been actually uh, going on for over 20 years in Brazil. And its core, by definition, is to address the employer to try to make, to incentivize the employer not to behave this way. Try to make the employer treat the employer with some dignity. So since then, just to give an idea of this chart, normally over 2,000 people, over 2,000 people are rescued every year from situations like these ones that I was showing. It's kind of a stable public policy in Brazil. You know, even in the, uh, during the last government, I think you have heard about it, <laughs> they weren't able to finish it. It's kind of well rooted. You know, it's there, let it go. Uh, we can say that regardless of many limits, it works. It, it has, has done a good job somehow. The point is that even with these uh, rescues every year, uh, first, working conditions are not improving. It's because of many factors. The problem is much wider, much broader, regards to many other, many other, other aspects. But also, what I want to stress here to get to the project, is that even the same workers are rescued again and again. So the same people that are caught in slave-like conditions, they face situations, similar situations, even worse situations, again and again. The ILO did a survey in Brazil uh, finding out that over half of workers that were rescued in situations like that, or had been submitted to the same situation prior to the rescue. Which tells us something very simple. You can rescue the people, you can take the worker from uh, that very extreme form of exploitation, but 
If the person does not have an option to survive, guess what's going to happen? The person will be available to be submitted to the same situation again and again. There's never been a consistent policy in Brazil <coughs> regarding the supply side. Who sells the workforce? The workers themselves. So we have, like I said, this task force to tackle slave by conditions regarding the, empo the employers. But there wasn't anything to address specifically the workers. What are they, what are, are they going to do after the rescue? They have to survive. They do not know the means of production. How are they going to survive? They're going to get back to the labor markets, probably, to face situations similar to which they have already seen prior. Thank you. No, 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 no. <laughs> now it starts. For how much have I talked? For how long? Okay. 26 minutes. Oh. So I'm going to give you a uh, taste of the project now. And my main aim then is to explain and chat with you to specifically how it goes. But just to give you a taste, Vida Pois Resgate, Life After Rescue, is a project based upon a very simple idea, which is the workers were rescued in the like conditions. What are they going to do now? The idea is, why not get the money paid by the employers, because they have to pay fines normally in the labor courts. You know, when I'm talking about fines, these fines could go up to $1 million. Why not direct these fines to the workers, but not giving them cash, literally. They also get cash for compensations and so on, wages. But why not get these fines to help them to organize democratic rural associations to produce food in the place that they belong from. We are pretty much like a huge percentage of uh, workers rescued. They are temporary migrants in Brazil, for example. Uh, the case that I'm going to talk a little bit about with you here, the workers are from Bahia. And they came to Rio Grande do Sul. We are talking here about like from, uh, I'd say Alabama to California. That far. And they came here to spend two months uh, picking grapes for very fancy wine producers. <coughs> it's one example, but it's very common. You know, all day around here, people come normally from this area here. But not only, you know, you have all kinds of internal migration, migration here, like from the uh, countryside to the capital, from Sao Paulo to Paraná, from, you have like this, this uh, very, very powerful agribusiness in this uh, with parts of Brazil. So there are a whole temporary migrant, uh, 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 yeah, migrant scheme migration scheme for work, temp work, and most of rescues are related to this framework. People coming all over the places for economic reasons. They come here, work, get seem exploited some one month, two months ago, they come back. The idea of the project is why not creating sustainable ways of life in your hometown so that you don't have to migrate. You can have a good life in your place. As simple as that get. So <coughs> the project takes the money from the fines and tries to incentivize and organize rural uh, associations to produce health foods. Why health foods? Because of many reasons you can imagine. Among them, because there is a program, another public policy in Brazil, that states that uh, public schools have to buy their meals, you know, for the children, from small producers. It's uh, institutional markets. 
So in this project, we link the production to these uh, institutional markets so that both we can deliver good food for the children. It also, you have to, you, you, you are able to step, stabilize, you know, make the, the income not so uh, uh, not variable. Big things. Not so unstable. Unstable. You no. Know? You have uh, in horizons of payments. No, no. I'm not going to make a lot of money, but I'm I'm always going to get some money. Uh, so, how it works? Then conceptually, the idea is simple. Then is instead of, for example, qualifying, training people to get them back to the labor markets, which is not like the worst idea, but keep making the person depending on the labor markets, let's just take people out of the labor market. Let's just take, make people autonomous, make people uh, powerful enough to live without depending on selling the workforce. That's the idea. Unleash people from labor market. Now you can live your life. That's nice, that's interesting, but to make it happen, there are a zillion different variables, very complex stuff. Like I said, I'm just gonna give you a little taste and then I can go further during our conversation or our dialogue here. First thing I said, all the money comes from uh, the fines. So it's even uh, friendly to the austerity narrative because you don't have to uh, use the budgets of the government. Uh, second, there is no struggle with uh, the employers at the place people belong from because you're not taking the land for anyone. You're buying the land. So you're avoiding another, avoiding another fight there. Uh, we approach the workers after the rescue and ask them would you be interested to stay at your home place, working there collectively with other workers, having a business, a democratic business there? Yeah, what kind of stuff would you think it's interesting? Would you like to uh, produce cocoa, acai? Would you like to uh, grow sheep, whatever? Everything regarding this project is thought trying to make the workers the protagonists of the process. That's the aim of the project. That's the very basis of the project, but it's also the main challenge of the project. It's very hard, and I can talk a little bit about it during our, our dialogue. To so make them take the lead instead of stay passive as they are used because of the labor market as wage earners. Uh, what do we use the money for? First of all, to buy the land, as I said. Sometimes we don't buy the land. We capitalize, let's say, uh, family lands that are already owned by these workers. It's common to have like small lands. But they are not uh, keep it to be economically uh, useful. So, for example, in this instance here, that I, the example that I said, when the guys were rescued here in, in Rio Grande do Sul, they are from the countryside of Bahia. It's a region called uh, Cisal Territory. It's a place very dry and has a background uh, related to, to the growth of sheep. And uh, pretty much all of them, they or their families, have some small lands. What we are doing there is to build, uh, I, I found the words barns, technically, the house of the sheep. Uh, and they are going to initially grow sheep to sell for meat. If things go well, the idea is to uh, turn this uh, production to uh, produce milk. 
that it's uh, both more intensive and uh, the price is better. In terms of income, it will be better. But it's much more complex regarding the technical, technical issues uh, demanded to make it work. So the other idea or aim of this project is to be uh, incremental, you know? Try to begin with something simple and see if people really engage. Uh, we can help them to, to make it uh, more complex. Well, uh, to finish here and start our, our, our chats, I'd just like to uh, stress that many institutions are parts of this project right now. Like I said, it aims to be a public policy. In fact, today, to this day, there are five associations, workers' associations, that were organized with the support of the Vida Pois Has Got. Uh, one of them produce in a farm, cocoa, in acai. Uh, three of them are related to this rescue that I talked about in Rio Grande do Sul. They will grow uh, ships initially, as I said, and the last one uh, is starting producing vegetables to summarize uh, what they are doing there. I can't say that things are already great. I can say that there are many challenges, but for sure the main challenge is to uh, make people believe that they can be the protagonists of the, not only the production, but protagonists of their lives indeed. And that's it. So do you, is, should I do the, the Q&A? Do you want to also be with us start off with some Some, some exchanges. Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. So um, I should just say I, for, for those of you who, who don't know, I work primarily on precarious labor. And so in addition to being an academic, I'm sort of an engaged activist on these issues. And when I heard, uh, you know, in the, as many of you probably know, in the labor um, sort of advocacy world in the U.S., um, there are two approaches. There is the labor regulation of employer approach. You do minimum wage, overtime, unionization. And then there's really no other approach um, except for maybe people talk about cooperatives. But law, the laws are make cooperatives actually quite difficult. There are some new laws in, in California over the last few years that have been, um, been more friendly to sort of democratic workplaces. But in addition to there being very concentrated markets in many sectors in the US with the rise of, of monopolies making it very different, difficult for cooperatives to function, there's also just a capital issue. Um, workers don't have the ability to invest in, um, in workplaces that can push them out of and keep them out of uh, the unequal aspects of the labor market. And so, um, you know, when, when I was in Brazil and Vitor told me about this project, I thought of two things. One, I thought of reconstruction and the failures of reconstruction. Um, one of the biggest failures of reconstruction was not transferring property to former slaves. Um, you know, this is what, this is what American historians um, uh, have written about for for many decades, um, and not you know despite the 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 Freedmen's Bureau not finding good work, basically just taking uh, the term wage slave emerged during this time period in the post post um, post slavery years, um, taking workers who were otherwise physically and economically dependent on um, on their you know their masters and essentially just. Uh, putting them in situations in which they had some mobility, um, but not uh, not conditions that were, you know, anything to write home about for sure. Uh, and so the analogies seemed really apt, and I wanted to sort of bring this 
I've never heard of a state program that, um, that actually helped workers to exit the labor market and create cooperative like workplace democracy in a, in a sustained way. Um, and so I wanted to raise the possibility in the US of, of what something, what, is, what this might look like. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I also, um, California is a state, as you know, that has tremendous, um, has a big agricultural economy. Our agricultural products are picked and cultivated by people who are in slave-like conditions. But under US law, we don't have a definition of modern slavery. And what was striking to me that I didn't realize, because the ILO, you said the ILO um, definition is also has an element of coercion in it. What I didn't realize is that, and what I think is actually quite brilliant, is um, both in the UK context and the Brazilian context, can you actually put that slide up where you um, talk about the, the European, sorry, the UK, UK law in particular? The consent language? Oh, you didn't create it. The language of, it, they address this head on, that consent, just because there's alleged consent, does not mean that you don't meet the definition of modern slavery. Which, so, this morning, I was talking to a reporter who said, well, what do you say when um, Uber says that these are not exploitative conditions precisely because the worker can leave at any time? Um, this is the fiction of exploitative employers, you know, from time immemorial, that as long as there's the possibility, as long as you are not physically chained to your workplace, then, um, then you are free. And what I think Vitor really underscores in his work is that that's just simply not the case. The structure of capitalism, um, unfettered capitalism, is one of extreme coercion. And, um, and recognizing that becomes quite important when we're thinking about creative solutions to um, fundamentally unequal systems. So I'm really, you know, uh, quite um, excited that, um, that this is also going to be recorded for other people to learn about. Um, I think there are opportunities to talk to um, California regulators about, about the project and ways that we can imagine similar things here. But a big problem in the US is that um, we lack enforcement. So um, Vitor says that you know, he was a labor investigator at the federal level. In the US, we have very dis uh, a, a, a labor law enforcement system that is very um, broken up. So the uh, employment discrimination laws are are enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Center or Commission. They work separately from the, the Department of Labor who oversees the Fair Labor Standards Act, minimum wage and overtime. They work separately from the National Labor Relations Bureau. All these different, who oversees, of course, union laws, all of these different entities have their own investigators and the dis, disjunct disjunctive nature of these, um, of these different sort of federal entities in particular make it quite difficult to coordinate these kinds of actions when in fact all of these horrible exploitative things that these individualized laws are meant to, um, meant to address are happening on a single person's body, right? Um, that, that person has to go to 10 different entities to have all of their various problems solved as just a um, an unfortunate outcome of, of the way uh, U.S. labor laws have been written in response to labor movements over many years and the intransigence of, of, um, of U.S. employers. Um, so I guess, you know, I would love to hear Vitor talk a little bit about what you have, I guess two things. Um, I'll start by asking what have you, um, what sort of thought have you given to this transnationally. You've worked in the UK, you've worked and you've worked and lived in Spain, you're familiar with these, um, the labor enforcement in all these different places. Is this, I mean, this is quite small, of course, um, in, in Brazil relative to the larger labor market, but what opportunities or possibilities do you see for, um, for growth? For, for to make this an, act, this an actual sort of equivalent response to the labor market regulation that we, that we engage in via labor laws. Um, and along uh, similar lines, what are the struggles that you have faced since you've gotten this project off the ground? Um, 
particularly how has it been to work with these workers who have otherwise just been subjected to really, um, you know, they're not social movement actors, they're not people who ideologically come to this these cooperatives through a commitment to workplace democracy. Um, this is this is bottom down still, even though we're talking about workplace democracy. And so if you could talk about both of those things. So, uh, regarding to make it like bigger, uh, it's feasible actually, because uh, as I said, over or more or less 2,000 people, workers are rescued every year, but uh, the number of cases aren't like huge. You're talking about, I don't know, 50 cases, 60 cases a year. So, uh, like, technically saying, it's not hard to make it. And that's the, the, the aim of the project, like its goal on a long term, is to offer the opportunity for every worker that's rescued in farms in Brazil, uh, the chance to join uh, Vida Pós Resgate. That's the goal. Uh, theoretically, it's not so hard. But it would need, or it needs uh, a degree of uh, engagement of different, institu different institutions that, let's say, that wouldn't be easy, you know? But like to, to be short this time, honestly, it's feasible. It's not something out of touch. You know, it could be like some, it is possible to happen. But it, it will depend, to summarize, of our ability, mine and from my colleagues, my partners, to engage different institutions in a way that it's first, uh, it gets more people involved, direct involved, like more public servants, because it's a lot of work to get things done here. And so we would need like more, I don't know, 20 people to, to make it happen. It's not so easy, but it's feasible. Uh, and we would have to, to get not only the sympathy, but the engagements, like the, the true engagements of some institutions to, to support it to support in deeds, you know, in fact, not only rhetoric, no, everyone <coughs> that gets in touch with this project in Brazil said it, it's great, it's a great idea and so on, but to make it a, a stable public policy that approaches, address every every case of slave-like conditions, we need more, more engagements. And the struggles, yeah, there are lots of struggles. As you can imagine, we face like dozens of millions of bureaucracy steps, bureaucratic steps, you know, paperwork. Uh, just to give you a clue, you know, I think I have talked to you about it, but to buy a land in Brazil, formally, you know, proper, properly, it's very difficult because uh, the process of occupation in uh, Brazilian countryside of the lands were are, were and still are pretty much illegal. Uh, it was, as you can imagine, marked deeply by violence and so on. So it's hard to get one lens with all the documents needed to make a, a proper uh, sale, a proper deal. For example, on the free, on the so-called, on the normal markets, it's easy to buy, to send a, a, a lens in Brazil. But like for the state to buy, you need a whole bunch of documents, beginning with what you call the the, the properties. Uh, uh, how do you call it here? Deed. You call it deeds. That states like this land is yours. You know, it's very hard to get there. It's very hard. So, which means that to begin with, we spend a lot of time that can kill the project itself, because 
during this dealing to get the land, the workers can just leave again. You know, you are helping to organize, they are engaging, but the land is not there and they like, look, we have to survive, we have to do something. If it's not done in certain amount of time, they will just take the roads and look for another uh, bad job, to say the least. Uh, but also, we have many other different uh, challenges regarding technical issues, you know. When I say technical issues, I, I'm talking about organizing the issues, juridical issues, you know, how to deal with an association. We, call, we prefer to call it cooperatives. In Brazil, normally called associations, rural associations. Uh, but the main issue, for sure, as I uh, mentioned during the talk, is to make workers really engage in the organization themselves, you know. They are so used, we are so used normally to the labor market, to follow someone leads, you know, to obey to any other one, to be alienated from work, that when they face the opportunity to do by themselves, they kind of feel paralyzed, you know, and I think that's for sure the, the main challenge to, to others. I wonder if we could go back to the slide where you look at the incidence of these number of these cases over time. So, yeah, there we go. So, you know, it would probably not be, seem all that surprising that under Bolsonaro you would see this sudden <laughs> increase. But what's really interesting to me partly is that, you know, here it would seem that under the PT, under the Workers' Party, under Lula, you're having the highest levels in history. So what's going on there? Great question. So the first thing here, I'm going to try to be short. Let's see if I can answer in two minutes. The first thing here is when you see the charts, you have to think about different factors, OK? First one, here, the public policy is just beginning. So that explains pretty much why the number of people rescued is much, much smaller. You know, things are starting to be organized. The article from the penal code, uh, it was defined, Vina, here. Oh, so they were doing the rescue before the article. Labor inspectors started to see so much degrading situations that even without the specific definition of slave-like condition, they started to do the public policy. So the public policy started prior to the legislation. And uh, then you have this sharp increase here. It's related to many factors. First of all, because now the public policy started to, to be really organized, you know. Here in 2003, after the, the penal code was changed, uh, the PT governments got many institutions together and said, look, we're going to make it, yeah, we're going to make it a public policy now and so on. So a lot of, a lot of inspections started to happen. So that's one factor. Also, at this point here, we had a boom on the agribusiness uh, area. And not only on the agribusiness area, but in some uh, activities that gather loads of people. So here we're talking about some of the rescues here on the sugarcane area in Soil, oh, I forgot in English. Anyway, soil beans, yeah. Uh, area on the west countryside of Brazil, Mato Grosso, and so on, some of the states. Some unique cases would get like a thousand people, one case. So that's also another factor that explains why these numbers went so high. So. The public policy started to be organized. Uh, the, the profile of the sector in terms of gathering too many people. Then what happened? Here, this uh, 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 decline is not because uh, there was some kind of change on the public policy regarding being like more or less effective. It was because it got so specialized in terms of knowing you know, I knew what to do, other labor specs knew what to do, that 
many other sectors started to be inspected as well. And the cases, if I got a chart from the number of cases, you'd see an incline, you know, an increase on the cases, but with less workers. So you'd have like 300 inspections with a thousand workers rescued. We're talking about domestic workers, we're talking about fishing, you know, like five people, six people, 10 people, instead of 300 people, a thousand people. Here, that's true <laughs> that it's our bad times, let's say, but it's also related to, to the pandemic, you know? So it's also much harder, even physically saying, to carry out the inspections. Do you have any sense of whether the prevalence of people working in these conditions declined after the enforcement in the, during the commodities boom? So those two spikes. Yeah. So then did it have a deterrent effect? Yep. Uh, so also admitted by them because of that. It wasn't that the workers' party under Rousseff got conservative. It's in, like you, you talked about the one thing about them getting more refined in the approach and going after smaller operations, but also maybe some of the big ones were people stop trying it. Yeah. Because they're worried about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah, please. Yeah. So um, I guess uh, the program you talked about at the end sounds really promising and interesting. And one of the things that I've been kind of thinking about lately is the um, challenge of getting good good programs to scale. Um, because, you know, back in the 90s, like, you know, John Braithwaite, the Law and Society scholar, had this work on, like, oh, we don't need to worry about changing capitalism at the commanding heights. We need to just create good models, good examples, and then they can be exported and transplanted to elsewhere and all that. So it seems like that's all. It seems like that that was way too optimistic. It doesn't work that way, it seems. Yeah. And so then I think part of it is uh, how do you um, figure out ways to make this salient and how do you connect it to other things? And something, when Bruno was talking about the relative lack of concern with like, uh, modern forced labor in the US. Uh, I, I, I can think of an ex exception to that, which is um, there are new laws on human trafficking mm -hmm. that are being passed in the states. So I know the one in Kentucky because we have uh, there's a class action on this, where um, it says um, uh, it, it makes illegal um, forced labor through coercion, um, deception, or fraud, or something like that. Um, and, uh, and then it provides three times the wages that were sold, taken from the person. Or, um, and um, so it's like basically we don't pay people. Um, and um, so then it's, it was written like it's a human trafficking and a sex trafficking law, I think. Mm -hmm. But it's broad enough that actually it could, um, like there's a lawsuit um, that says, you know, that this company was, um, would have people clock into the system and all that. And then after the fact, the manager would reduce their pay. Uh -huh. And so then the claim is that that's forced labor. But- um, That's your lawsuit? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, uh, my thinking is um, uh, that this might be an opportunity to, because there's big transnational advocacy around human trafficking, and then could the, and then maybe this could be connected to that and say this is a reasonable remedy for these types of things. And maybe it's not just like agricultural cooperatives, but other things as well. Uh, just, just a thought. But uh, I don't know if people are trying that in Brazil at this point to try to scale this. But I don't know if you've seen any dialogue between the concerns about human trafficking and then this approach. Well, actually, if I would like, if it was like a proper class and everything, human traffic is part of this issue. Like, I mean, by the definition. The north to the south, yeah. Oh, in the law as well. Okay. I didn't talk about it because okay. otherwise it would take a long time. Mm -hmm. But in Brazil, things are completely connected. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, we don't we do we do not even have to talk about it because everybody knows that they are linked. Mm -hmm. There is a, a specific article on the, on the penal code regarding human trafficking. Normally, when we, when we carried out the rescues, uh, this article is used together with uh, human trafficking mm -hmm. article. So perfect, yeah. But it seems like all these transnational NGOs and uh, UN bodies and stuff that prioritize human trafficking they should get interested in this, it seems. Yeah. yeah. But the point is, uh, in my point of view, normally this, this emphasis on the human trafficking 
It, it's good, it's something very important and so on, but it's because people think about the, the individual coercive issue, you know? It's like, if there is consent, everything is good. So I think that what I'm trying to say is that what you say is so important that it needs to be stressed. You know, look, human trafficking, it's that, that's this picture here, you know? It's not like something apart from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I mean, it's true in the U.S. also that you have, like, the visas that we're talking about, the T visas. Um, the, she, this is all during the Bush administration. The human trafficking laws all happened during Republican administrations because there is this sense that this is an individualized problem. And it is linked to conservative ideas about family, about, mm -hmm. um, about sex in particular, um, and, um, and about sex work in particular. And so there's a way in which this is very like exciting, which I didn't know about this case, in which mm -hmm. you're like using this otherwise quite conservative approach to, um, to thinking about these problems purely through the, the lens of sex trafficking or human trafficking to, to think more broadly about, about labor. Um, you had a question, yes. Yes, I was curious, what are the, um, relate, if there are any relationships between these agricultural crops cooperatives in the MST, because I know the MST has done many blind occupations, and I think similar sort of, uh, you know, rural cooperatives, is there like a relationship between them, or like learning from their experiences? That's a very great question, actually a very expected question. <laughs> At some points, we are going to try to use their knowledge mm -hmm. to help. The thing is, in uh, Vina ha has brought it here. Uh, those workers are not politicized, hmm. you know? So it's so like. Yeah, no, okay. His, his project, yeah. Uh, at some points, when they are more organized, I think that not only the MST, but other, other initiatives, other social movements, it's very diverse. I mean, MCT is just one. It's the most important, the biggest one, and so on. But there are many different uh, uh, social movements with different styles. And of course, the idea is to, to get in touch with them. Uh, but empirically saying, it's something for when uh, things are more organized. That's what I'm trying to say, you know? <clears throat> the workers themselves, they have to create for this, the associations already exist. They have to create an identity from them, you know? Uh, and then, for sure, the idea is to, to... Actually, we are... We have been talking to people for some years now. So it's in our sight. Okay, awesome. Well, I think, should we end? I think we've, we've, gone, we've gone over. I was actually asking when we're supposed to end, so I don't know. But yeah, I, I think that we've gone over, but I... Um, I am happy to stay later if you want to stay later to chat with people, but maybe we could formally end and just thank you for coming and giving us the presentation.